Thank you all for coming. I'm seeing all these names popping up on attendees. Hi, Ray. <laughs> All right, I haven't heard from Chrissy K. Oh, there he is. Yay! How's that sweet potato and kale? Wait, I got to rename your new thing. Uh, mouth, I, don't, I don't think you want to be me. My mouth is on fire. Because. Chili? Let's figure out. My mouth is burning up over here. <laughs> is that why you got sweat beads going down your nose? No, I'm just joking. Must be old age or something. What? Must be old age. You know anything about that, Emma? Nope. What is it? Asian don't raise them? Nope, not at all. <laughs> brown don't brown, black don't crack. <laughs> all right, everyone good? Well, welcome everybody. Um, I think we're on live too with um, Facebook Live. So I'm actually going to um, share this. Sorry. But thank you everyone for coming. My name is Emlyn Lee. I am the founder of Brave Communities and Brave stands for Building Relationships, Awareness, Voices and Engagement. And so we host monthly community conversations, um, typically in person, but now we've been doing it um, digitally. So um, thank you for being here, especially on this beautiful Thursday evening. Um, I just want to thank you um, and welcome the panelists. So thank you, Dr. Rowe. I'll, I'll go in by first name. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Angelica, and thank you, Kazike. Um, before I start with a, a, a moment of, uh, for you to introduce yourselves, I just wanna do maybe like a 30 second moment of silence in honor of Mike Ramos, in honor of George Floyd, um, Breonna Taylor, and so many others' um, lives that have been lost. And so just do a 30 seconds of moment of silence. All right, thank you so much. Um, so before we, um, before I get you all to introduce yourselves, um, as we know, our nation is really um, hurting right now. Um, everything from, um, you know, the police brutality and lives, black lives being lost to even the, um, the disproportionality of, of black and brown community being affected by COVID. And so, there's so much going on. There's so much emotions that's happening for individually and community wide. Um, and so what we see on the streets um, with the protest is a type of movement. And then what we're going to be talking about tonight is another type of way that we can be active, which is through civic engagement. And so I want to thank these three panelists for um, sharing your wisdom and your time. And um, I'm just going to um, let you all kind of self introduce yourselves because I can't do justice of, of, of all the accomplishments that you do and, and your passion for serving the community. And so I'm going to start it off, do it. I usually do like first name alphabetical. So Angelica, you're up. Thanks a lot, Evelyn, for the invitation. My name is Angelica Razzo. I work for Oracle Corporation as a diversity and inclusion consultant, uh, overseeing, you know, community relationships as well as our internal HR communications to our employees. Uh, aside from that, I'm the vice chair for the Hispanic Quality of Life, and I s sit on the Texas STEM agency. I also sit on a couple nonprofits, the New Philanthropist, Earth Day, and then the Cybersecurity Nonprofit Organization for Austin, Texas. So just really excited to be here and want to give Kazike a shout out because when I started my civic engagement, he was one of the first people I called asking for advice, and it's just great to, to be in the same platform with him. Thank you. And thank you so much, Angelica. Um, and Hannah, how about you? Oh, wait, JK, H-I-J-K. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hannah? <laughs> I, I was actually having a moment. <laughs> 
<laughs> You're not alone. Um, thank you so much, Emlyn, for, um, for inviting us for this conversation. Um, I'm really honored to be here um, and to be connecting with Angelica and Kazike. It's nice to meet you both and to um, um, hold this space together with you all. Um, so um, I'm Hannah Rowe. Um, I am the uh, currently the 2020 Census Manager for the Austin Asian Complete Count Committee. So this is one of the um, uh, the many com complete count committees um, that are um, uh, actively seeking to get out the count for the 2020 census. Um, we've been at work for several months, um, and as you all know, um, the uh, deadline has been extended through the end of October, so um, there is a little more time left still, but um, the urgency um, continues to grow. Um, so, um, and my background further is, um, I'm, I'm actually a writer and um, just finished my graduate studies in philosophy of religion. Um, so I spent a really <laughs> good 10 years of my um, adult life um, in school. <laughs> um, and so um, I studied philosophy and um, spirituality and um, most recently the intertwinement of um, religion and colonialism in modern Korean history. Um, and um, and uh, I also serve on the board of the Asian Pacific American Public Affairs Austin chapter. Um, and um, I, um, I'm so honored to be here. And um, I feel in some ways kind of like the wind has be been behind my back as I'm, I find myself in this position. Um, um, I, I really do believe that civic engagement is an act of love. Um, and um, we, I think as a nation, as a community, are, are uh, reckoning with some real um, moral questions about who we are and who we want to be. And, um, and I think it is now more important than ever to come together to have honest conversations, no matter how uncomfortable. Um, and so I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Emlyn, thank you so much for inviting me. I appreciate the, the invitation. I'm glad to be with my compadres, my co-conspirators here today. Uh, as you know, I'm, um, I'm with the uh, African American Clique Account Committee. Uh, my main role there was around communication, um, trying to get the, the word out and how to do that. And we uh, worked together to develop a video. Uh, but my, <clears throat> my day job, is split between uh, being the founder and CEO of uh, Jelani Consulting LLC. Organization has been around for about 13 years, based here in Austin, Texas, um, but I work across the country, uh, primarily remotely now because of the COVID uh, pandemic. And also work here in the city of Austin for Mayor Steve Adler is one of the senior policy advisors focusing on issues that range the gamut that focus on, of course, on equity inclusion, but also um, public safety, uh, and, and, and part of my title is also education coordinator. So I work with school, school districts. Uh, so there are seven school districts in Texas City of Austin. And so I would collaborate with <clears throat> many of the superintendents and other leadership and other nonprofits across the community um, to ensure that we're doing the best we can for, for our uh, young people. Uh, those are my, I'll, I'll stop there. And he's also a flourishing chef on Thursday evenings. You can check him out on, is it Chopping It Up with Kazike? Yes, chopping it up with TVK. I had to explain that to a few folks, but yeah. So thanks. Um, well, Hannah, I'm gonna. You were talking about the census and um, and how important it is. I, I mean, I'm older than I look, and I'm trying to think like if the census is every ten years. I honestly cannot remember like if I filled out the census in the past. Like as an adult, like I could have technically done it two or three times. And so I don't even um, remember it being so important. And right now I'm just like, oh my gosh, everybody, please fill it out. Like we, in fact, Brave is just going to start a census challenge and we're gonna to try to even reward you all with gift cards. And thank you for the um, AACC's funding. And so we partnered with Slab Barbecue and NG Cafe to try to um, like encourage people to, um, to fill out the census and then we can, we'll randomly pick people um, so, um, can you just explain more about the census? And then when you're talking about like the deadlines and the timeline, I know things have changed with the COVID, but right. like, why is it important? Um, like, does it really matter? I also know there's been like some skepticism, especially as, you know, from communities of colors of like, does it even matter? Like, what are they, what information are they getting from us? 
and what are they going to do with it? Um, and then also how it's related to like COVID and the resources that we are in dire need of now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, the, the this is every 10 years. Um, and um, it's also actually, I, I learned this recently, but it's also technically called um, the population and housing census. And it's actually mandated by our constitution. Um, specifically Article 1, Section 2, um, and it's designed to count every single resident in the U.S. Um, so at stake is a lot. Um, at stake is money and power. Um, so uh, uh, on the one hand, um, we the census is used to, um, uh, to basically apportion the number of seats that each state gets uh, in the U.S. House of Representatives. Um, and and um, every 10 years, this data is then used to redraw boundaries of congressional and state legislative districts to account for population shifts. Um, so as y'all know, um, uh, Austin is an incredibly gerrymandered city if you look at our, the way that it's been dis districted. Uh, so this is our opportunity to actually make that shift. Um, it's really important um, for our political representation. Um, our electoral participation has direct links to the census data. So um, a fair and accurate census is crucial in that regard. Um, and then in terms of uh, federal resources and funding, so hundreds of billions of dollars, um, at least $675 billion are distributed according to census data to local communities. Um, so we're looking at some, like schools and hospitals and roads, um, student loan programs, and absolutely public health and public safety. So all of these resources that we're talking about that is, that is um, in crisis right now in the pandemic, um, that absolutely does have everything to do with census data. And then also it's used um, in the private sector as well. So businesses, when they want to open up factories or offices or stores, um, create jobs and even grocery stores, census data is used every day um, to, uh, to determine where those go. Um, and so if you, if you can imagine because of this um, really understandable, um, his, uh, understandable mistrust in government that especially communities of color have, that means that if we don't get counted, then we, the communities don't get the resources that we need in order to thrive and to live in dignity. Um, and so um, I, I would say too that most importantly, apart from all these more like rational like reasons why it's so important, um, I would say too that it, this is our civic duty and our responsibility to think about the common good, um, and what benefits the community as a whole. Um, so the, it, for every person that's undercounted, that's at least $1,500 per person that gets lost. And that's um, over the course of 10 years, we're really looking at like $15,000 at the very least uh, per person. Um, in terms of, and I think, and I, I, get, I think you're gonna address this further um, to open it up, but um, in terms of the, um, the, some of the myths that, that, that should be addressed and debunked. Um, the citizenship question in particular um, was a really contested one um, and there's still confusion around it. There is no citizenship question, um, a citizenship or your status of citizenship on the census. Um, and so everybody counts um, and, uh, and our data, it really is kept co confidential. So um, every employee of the Census Bureau, so I'm not an employee of the Census Bureau, we're a partner of the Bureau, but um, uh, everyone who, um, who uh, is a census taker is sworn to protect this data. And uh, it's, it's really serious. That, so if they, if they violate this privacy, um, uh, it will, um, there, there are some, some legal ramifications. And so they're, uh, it, the data is encrypted, so it's only used for statistics, and it's also made anonymous. And so I just want to lay that out there as well. Um, but I think that kind of is an overview uh, so, uh, for now that I, I'll just lay out there. Um, sorry. I'm glad that thing pops up, but it's like, you're muted. Um, so just a couple more questions, Hannah, because I think you might like the timeline, because, um, you know, it, it, it officially, I mean, the National Day for Census was supposed to be, it was April 1st, but then that kind of got like um, washed away with the peak of, of COVID. Um, 
And then I think like now they're trying to encourage people to fill it out electronically or um, on the phone and you know mail in because they are going to have representatives go out and not and like actually house visit and try to get people to um, fill out the form. Is that correct? Right. So um, so they're okay. So there. Let me back up as well. Um, Right now, the deadline for self-response is October 31st, so Halloween, <laughs> to easily remember. Um, but um, it really, uh, you can do it now and you can absolutely do it. Um, there are three ways online um, at my2020census.gov and then a uh, paper questionnaire um, if you haven't already filled out the form online. And you can also um, uh, do it over the phone by calling the number at the 2020census.gov uh, website. Um, and then in terms of census takers coming to knock on people's doors, that is, um, that is, uh, at, at the moment, if, if I haven't, um, if it hasn't been further extended, um, it is, it is happening in mid July, I believe. Um, so obviously for their own safety, because we, you know, it looks like COVID will be continuing on the, the effects of it will be continuing on, um, for everyone's safety, it's better to do it online so that a census taker does not have to come knocking on your door. And this is a mm -hmm. reminder, especially for hard to count communities. Right, right. And Angelica, and, and um, do you have any um, words or words of wisdom to help, especially like the Hispanic community? Because that's such a, a big, large community here in Austin and Travis County. Yeah, I think it's important for our community to to ensure that all our family members are, are collected in regards to their information because there's resources for people that are undocumented that they greatly need. Um, and, and ensuring that you're collecting all the information. Um, if there's a question that makes you uncomfortable, it's not recommended to skip it, but you can do that. And that's been important for the LGBTQ community. For example, you know, if you don't identify as male or female, and that question just doesn't resonate with you, you do have the option to pass it over, which I think it's really powerful and important. But it's crucially important to take 10, 15, 20 minutes to be able to take the census because that dictates what type of resources we receive in our community. So it's hard, you know, whenever we're like, we, we see um, not a good allocation of resources, it makes it harder where you're not properly counting people. So it's it's important that we do our part in, in collecting our information you know a call of action that that i've personally done is um you know when i go to my friend's house i'm like have you done the census no okay we're gonna do it right now and i'm just that friend that that's doing that because i find that to be important i need to make sure that they're being taken care of i'm taken care of because our community is better taken care of if we're counting each other that's great um thank you um, and, and the other thing too, is that the census is in multiple language. I almost like it's in so many different languages, like Spanish obviously, and then in the Asian, um, is it on the actual My 2020 Census website that's also in multiple languages or just the AACCC one? Oh, you can uh, go straight to the 2020census.gov website and then that will list the, um, all the available languages. Um, and mm -hmm. then um, there's a, uh, in terms of if you were doing it over the phone, I believe I think it's 13 languages that are available over the phone, but obviously um, uh, you can also, but the, in terms of the translation of resources, that's sure. also uh, like more, there's a more comprehensive list. Right, okay. And Kazike, any words of wisdom for the Black community or how we can um, get more counted? Well, you know, uh, many African Americans, uh, most, I think it's important to say Black because we're not talking just African Americans who live here in the United States, but we have uh, Black um, immigrants from other mm -hmm. countries who come here, and so we're also trying to attend to their needs. But <clears throat> the history of the census and Black community has not been a good one. Um, if you're like me, um, who was kind of the unofficial junior league uh, historian uh, family tree person, uh, it's kind of nice to go back and look at the census from the you know, 1800s and early 1900s. But uh, it's an unsavory thing to go back and look at, you know, people who were slaves who didn't have names, who didn't. So we have this unfortunate relationship with the census because um, being counted didn't really serve us, right? Uh, who cares? you counted me. I'm just a piece of property to you. 
Uh, whereas today is a very different relationship. And I'll be honest, I like you, Emlyn. I, I, I have I had kids, and so I'm pretty sure we did the census, but I don't remember. Um, but I'm definitely being vigilant now about it because of the direct impact. I think the challenge is for a lot of people is that there's a disconnect. Mm-hmm. They also how making this choice today has impact on our daily lives. And we also, I mean, there might be the political aspect. That's assuming you're political. So if you're not political, then how does this impact my life? Well, it's school. It's roads. It's the things that you actually use on a regular basis, and if those funds are not allocated, uh, the way they ought to be, uh, we lose out. Uh, we literally lose out because our communities, as a result, are not getting the resources. Uh, we're already feeling like we're the last one served, um, or last one's considered. Um, and so it's important to take at least this uh, step to empower ourselves to get the money that we're supposed to be receiving. Because um, it's our money. We, uh, like other communities, we help build this city and we want our portion. Um, and so for me personally, I think I take a, like, I'm going to take a personal, uh, let's look up in data, like, I'm doing my census. <laughs> You're not going to stop me from doing my census. Right. Uh, uh, and, and for me, it, you know, I, I'm glad what uh, uh, Jilly said earlier, you know, um, you know, it might take you, you know, 10 minutes. And I think that our slogan is nine questions, nine minutes. Um, I think I did nine in seven and a half minutes just because I wanted to prove my mom. Ooh, look at him. <laughs> I think I hear a little competition going on. Yeah, but I'm not sure. I think I got all the questions right, so we'll see. <laughs> but um, I, I, I think it's important to acknowledge that history. Uh, there's a question of what do we do with people who are in our you know, penal code, uh, who are in our jail system? Uh, what do we do? I mean, there's just all these questions. And I think they're legitimate questions because I think there's this genuine distrust. And, as Hannah mentioned earlier, the whole question about citizenship. That, in my opinion, was an intentional strategy to keep people fearful. Uh, we already have a problem with uh, any kind of government official telling them, uh, even if it's code, and you know, <laughs> if they show up in the house, you're like, who that? You know? And so the idea, of, I, I'm glad that Hannah brought up the idea that you can do this online or fill out the form ahead of time. You don't have to worry about someone coming. Mm-hmm. Out. Because uh, now I have to open that, open up the door to something that I'm, I'm fearful that may actually cause some more problems. And so I think really emphasizing the need to complete it online or fill out the form ahead of time to avoid people coming later on, but also make the direct connection between you filling out that census and getting that fifteen hundred dollars, not necessarily in your pocket, but in your community. To sure. Your community. Thank, you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so thank you. I'm going to go to the chat board. I think Laura asked a question. And so audience, if you have any questions or if you're watching on Facebook and you have any questions, just write, pop it down in the chat board. Um, or he, um, in the Zoom, you also have the Q&A section. Um, but Laura said, I'm curious how we can talk about as a community the complexity of racial identity and national dialogues like code switch that highlighted the census, the good and the bad or complex nature of it. Um, I, I think we can talk about it, but, but it's acknowledging there's some real limitations on how we're being identified through the census. Um, you know, the truth of the matter is there's a difference between race and ethnicity, but in our government forms, they're blended together as if they're the same thing. And so it can be really confusing for some folks. Um, and so I think fundamentally we got to, we, we have to take action and not let that, that confusion stop us. But again, that's, that's, that's kind of the not so hidden agenda to keep people inactive or not participate because it's like, oh, it's, it's, more, it's more of a hassle. I mean, do I really need to pick one of those categories? I mean, it's, 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 it's make it as inconvenient as possible. But I try to remind people it is, it is a short uh, form for the most part. But as far as the whole debate around you know, categories, um, I think if you don't know anything, just do the do your best. How do you identify? You know, without having to worry about what government wants to call you, but just how do you identify? Um, if there's any questions around that, then you know, maybe ask your people around you. Uh, what's really funny is that in past years when we've done the census, you know, they have that other category. Well, a lot of people who are in that other category actually identify as white. Um, and so it's, it's interesting how pe- even people you would think would know could I acknowledge that oftentimes they're not quite sure how to, how to name themselves. But mm-hmm. in the end, it's really about allocating funds back to your community. And so I, I hope that doesn't become a barrier for folks to actually uh, make a choice to put on the phone. Sure, thanks. And did someone say, um, like, 
what kind did, I'm sorry, did um, Angelica or Hannah, do you want to add anything to? Uh, sure, actually. Um, I just want to provide a, a, an example that um, uh, of this, of the ways that these categories are out are outdated um, and, and that this is a living, breathing conversation. Um, and so if we, if we don't identify the way that we identify, um, then it doesn't force further conversation so that the next census 10 years later maybe could look different. Um, but I think that the only way that we can force those conversations is to actually um, show up and take the census. Um, so an example of this is actually, um, uh, for example, with the Iranian community, that we uh, there was a um, it, it, there's a history in which a, the older generation of Iranians have identified as white, and when we heard that, I was like so alarmed. <laughs> and so uh, there's a there's an internal debate and, and conversation, but also just this larger question of um, well, why was that the case? And also um, there the the younger generation then raise this uh, concern that that actually constitutes erasure and that it's really important to even if it it's it's hard like I, I like to, to check the box other and then to put down write down Iranian for example that actually can be really empowering and make a difference if enough people do that over time and then and then um, you could add the another category um, you know push the the census bureau to actually add another category um, uh, for um, uh, Middle Eastern North African, for example, in the next census. So I think that that's an example of a way in which um, uh, basically not, uh, not identifying um, uh, can, ha can ha have further co consequences as well. Um, but I also recognize for sure, though, um, that um, it, it's really hard. I think that it, I, I think so much about um, uh, non-binary folks like what like is you know on, on that question about sex you know like I um and it, it and I think it's important to name that that's um that's not good <laughs> so um so I think that the more vocal we become about it I think the better and so um I think the Neil she um asked what kind of questions are on there I think we kind of like it's a lot of uh, the gender um race um, y'all help me all. <laughs> what was that? Uh, income, I believe, is on there. It's like a range. Mm, an income range. Is, is it how many people live in your house? I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm failing it because I don't have it in front of me, but I think those are the general questions. So. You did it really quick in seven minutes. Yeah, yeah, seven and a half minutes. <laughs> um, thank you, Mark, Michael. So Michael was saying regarding the census, Texas is 55.2% complete and Austin is 58.5% as of June 2nd. And we're supposed to be a like politically charged city. And I think we can do better, everybody. Everybody who here has not put out their census, not, not the panelists, but audience wise, um, I want you to find your census. And then follow Brave. We're going to be passing out gift cards and everything. So Fill out your senses, tag friends, and then you could do that. Oh, thank you, Laura. Yeah, one ah. thing I wanted to add, like, about the census, like, I remembered a very vivid memory whenever there was a census counter that came to our house when I was a child, and my mom telling my cousins to hide in the closet because they were undocumented, and I was a translator, I think I was maybe eight years old, I was translating for my family, and I was telling them it's okay. They said they said they just want to do it because it means money for our community. And they were like, it's too high risk. We don't want them to know. Eyes can come to the house. And I just remember that fear because the census is a part of the government. And uh, there's a lot of fear like that in the community. So for those that that are in similar situations, just know it's important to count. Um, and it's great that you're able to do it online this time. It's yeah. And I, I, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I, just wanna, I was going to highlight what uh, um, uh, Angelica was saying. I mean, the whole move, it was like the closest we've ever had in our country, I think, where there was a question about whether information could be used to somehow uh, come after people who are undocumented. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and it was intentional because now we're left with this bad feeling. Our, 
like really asking because it's this feeling like they they really will do it. And and the reason why they feel that, and this is not irrational. I don't think people are being irrational. They're saying, look at other things that have happened in our government that have happened that we thought would not happen. Right. And so they're saying, if that can happen, why wouldn't this happen? The great thing, I think, what's unique about this because it is part of our constitution, um, and and there's very specific rules. Where other areas, there was some wiggle room that people weren't aware of, and the government took advantage of it. In this situation, there isn't that level of wiggle or room for error. Uh, uh, but I think the, the feeling that was created uh, that made it kind of ambivalent, I think, led, and then we were already feeling ambivalent about the government in general. This just added. Mm. So I just wanted to hyper uh, focus on that piece, which is really important. Yeah, and, and, and the reason I brought that up is because, you know, the census doesn't ask for citizenship, but, you know, whenever you file your taxes, the mentality my mom had at the time was, I file my taxes, I said I have two children in the house and a husband, and if I say I have additional people, they're going to say, wow, there's undocumented folks there, so I saw something in the chat, so I thought I'd address it. Yeah, good point. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to also address as well that um, that it is illegal for the Census Bureau, um, even though it is a government agency, to share any information with any other government agency. So that's actually illegal. Um, so that's I think important to to call um, to name. Right. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Stephen, for putting that dashboard link there. So if anybody that's kind of the, shows the dashboard, I believe of um, is that showing the maybe the Travis County area. Um, and then thank you, Amy Wu, for doing that. And then the citizenship question is not included, correct? Um, but if, if audience, if you have any questions um, on Facebook, if you have any questions, feel free to write them on chat board and then we'll get that to you. Um, so now let me ask the panelists, um, you know, if, if you want to, I would love for you to share your personal story um, of um, what does voting, you know, and, and what does civic engagement mean to you and as far as like voting and um, like, you know, whether it's to you, your family, the history of, of voting in America um, and to your community. And so um, I would love to hear that story. We'll go backwards with starting with Kazuki. Um, you know, one of the things I know from the research is that families that vote uh, transfer that, that habit of that tradition to their kids. And so I, I have to give a lot of credit to my mother who voted uh, pretty frequently. Uh, my grandfather who voted, he actually wrote letters to George Bush and called him a pork chop uh, because my grandmother wasn't getting some services. But believe it or not, my point is they're civically involved and engaged. And so I voted uh, and my kids, when it was time for the, the vote, they voted too. However, I want to distinguish something. I was the kind of person who voted mostly in federal elections, right? Ran for president. And maybe if there's some other things on the ticket, I would do that stuff too. It wasn't until later on in my life that I actually started, I mean, I voted for like the governor, uh, but depending on what state you live in, that may not align with when uh, the president being uh, elected. And so it wasn't, it wasn't the consistency. And again, depending on where you live, there can be elections in, in March versus in November. And so I was a person, you know, if it wasn't convenient, like if it wasn't downstairs or on the way home, I was like, hmm. Uh, but actually, in my since I've been here in Austin, I've been more civically engaged. And one of the things I've I've had to appreciate working in city government is that the the the, the work that impacts people's daily life is not what happens in Washington. Uh, it's, it does impact your life, but it's actually the day to day stuff. You know how your what your roads look like, uh, who picks up your garbage, how your sanitation is taken care of, your parks, your local police and law enforcement. All that is local. And so who you elect to be mayor, to be your trap, your uh, county uh, leads, uh, all that is local. And, and your judges, I mean, all those things are local and we sleep on that because we somehow thought the thing that was really important was the president, which it is, but actually the day-to-day -day activities are the local elections. And so, but I do think one of the challenges is that how do you stay up to speed on all of that? You know, uh, there's the, um, several different resources around town. Different news, newspapers will endorse it for folks. What I've had to do is to make that a habit where I look at the Chronicle or I look at other publications and say, oh, well, who are they endorsing? Who are they looking for? I'll, I might call one of my friends. I have people who call me and say, who are you voting for? I'm like, I don't know. I'm not telling you. 
but it's it's part of the it's part of the the lore and and culture and traditions of people who vote on a regular basis. I think the difference from my generation versus my mother's is that she did it kind of like you know civil rights, like we gotta vote and you know try to make the world a different place. Whereas for me, I think I I deepened some of those experiences because I I, I learned that local government actually has a regular impact on my life, and so that tradition has grown. Um, and thankfully, my kids because they hit they I bug them. I like to wake them up. Hey, you vote yet? <laughs> you better vote. Uh, and my daughter, who's uh, becomes she wants she goes to Prairie View A&M, and if you know anything about the history of Waller County, they've had all kinds of problems of uh, Republicans trying to shut down primarily the black vote in that county because if all the students out there voted, they would take over the county, and so they try to prevent them from voting by doing things like taking the voting site, the poll off campus, uh, moving into a place that's inconvenient. And so my daughter got involved with that kind of process and her, so, and she, and for her, the reason why she stays involved because she thinks about things like universal health care. Because if you have any kind of health issue impacts your life, who you vote into office is really important. Um, and so those are the kinds of things that I think folks learn about why they should vote, how they stay involved, uh, using their community as a way of staying engaged and involved and informed. Uh, and those are kind of the traditions that come out of my family. Absolutely. Thank you so much. No, it's true. I, I mean, I, I agree. I, um, you know, when I voted, I was always like more concerned of the big national ones. And then until like more recently in the past like six years, it's so much more important for like the local and, you know, like the state and local. And then now we see it, I mean, especially with COVID, you know, like, and with the police brutality, you know, like district attorney is so important in a, in a community. Your judges, um, your, you know, um, the Travis County commissioner and everyone is like making these big decisions. And so it's really important for us to go out and vote and also like making sure that we register to vote. Um, so I, I, I have um, uh, some dates that I have, but it's on my other computer. I don't, can't figure out how to like copy and paste it over to this chat board. But what we do is we add you into the newsletter and then afterwards we have a follow up newsletter. Um, and so I'll we'll share some information with you on that. My cat is determined to come make an appearance on this and she will not leave this laptop alone. Angelica and Hannah, do you, um, to carry on with like, how, what do, or I'll start with Hannah. Here she comes. Um, so <laughs> I just had to push her off, sorry. Um, for Hannah, like, for what does voting mean to you? And then, you know, like, um, your family, your community, um, and if you want to share your personal story, I'd love that. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, so, yeah, I, I think I, I, I have a similar um, experience of learning only in recent years how important local elections were, um, or like all of the, like, I think the, the long ballot was so intimidating to me, um, to be honest with you all. Um, and so it, it just took me a while. It, it took me um, some time to realize like how important it actually was to do some thorough research, even for that ballot, um, for the long, the length of the ballot. Um, but um, kind of going back to my upbringing and my family, um, so I actually, in, in the States, I grew up in the States and in Korea, but uh, in the States, um, I didn't uh, really grow up in a very politically active household. Um, and, and so this is sort of a hard lesson that I kind of had to learn on my own through my uh, network um, um, uh, in my more formative years um, uh, as an adult. And so um, it, it's been a, it's been an, really interesting journey of kind of learning that um, it's not um, that all of these um, personal goals that I had, you know, whether it's like career related or so on, that that those those goals, those degrees, the achievements, um, um, it it's not enough. Um, and that it's, it's not enough also because it doesn't really address kind of even a more like almost existential question of like what are places in the world? What is my place in the world? And so in order to do in order to address that question honestly, um, it means that when we 
claim our identity and belonging, um, which, which are questions that I think I've been thinking about for a really long time, um, we, we, got, we, we have to show up for one another and that it can't be, just, it cannot, we don't exist in a vacuum, none of us exist in a vacuum. Um, and so, um, and I think it, it uh, as I was learning, and I'm still like, you know, I'm, I'm learning very much still um, that, um, you know, especially for the Asian American community in particular, like we, we owe, we owe the black and brown community. We owe, we owe the, 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 the civil rights uh, fight uh, that happened in the 60s. And th it's because of that, that immigration was possible for Asian communities. Um, and so uh, this is a this is a sacred right, and it's it's a it's a responsibility. Um, and I think that part of it too is that I think when I think about voting, it immediately it's it's not just about um, making my personal voice heard, right? Like it, I think that it's it there's an ethical dimension to it. It's the invitation to not just think about self interest, but to like what it means to vote. Our conscience means. What does it mean? What does the common good look like, and how can I partake in creating that? What can I do to be a part of that? Um, and uh, and I think that it's it's that that it just that means it takes time to actually do the research to to look up who's on the ballot, even though no matter how long it is, and it does take time. Um, but uh, I think that I, I think it's the ethical question that kind of like forced that reckoning for me. Thank you for that. And Angelica, how about you, your personal narrative of voting and? Yeah, I think for me, uh, how I take on voting is just reminding myself that there's been a lot of people, there, there was a lot of people who gave up their life for this right. And, and I take that extremely serious. Um, I vote all the way down every single person, even those that are just one person on the ballot, I have to make the conscious decision, am I going to give them my vote or not? Uh, so it, it's very personal to me. My sister also served in the military. So um, I think about her whenever I'm voting and, and what she did for this country and for all the military members as well. So my, my take for, for voting, usually what I do is um, for the local level, if I have not met the candidate myself and I have not been able to ask them a question for, for local, municipal, as well as state, I do not vote for them. You know, it's, it's harder to do on a presidential level. Uh, but I do not vote for them if I have not been able I also like to look at these uh, resources. Uh, oftentimes does an incredible job where kids are able to fill up questionnaires and then they say that you could just read and counter them to see this is one person's belief, this is the other. Um, and I try to see which one has the best, best uh, ideologies on things that align to me. But I also think about, you know, family members of mine that, that can't vote um, and what that means for them. Um, so it's, it's crucially important. A lot of people suffer whenever bad decisions are made. And for the candidates, uh, other things that I look at is, you know, who, who is backed up by PACs? Because most of them will get more money than the underdog. And I'm the type of person that likes to give the chances to underdogs. Um, you know, women, like if there's a woman running out, I'll, I'll look at her, you know, here, I'm going to donate additional funds if she has good policies or a person of color, just wanting to make sure that not only am I voting, um, but I'm endorsing and I'm giving my dollars, I'm backing my, my, my dollars to make sure that I'm supporting the cause and also challenging my friends to, to support them too. Uh, for me, you know, uh, with my, my girlfriend, she doesn't like it, but I'll sign her up to these, uh, like this, these text campaigns from, from other candidates that she's like, I'm not sure if I like them. And I'm like, well, you're going to get their texts, you know, and I find it to be romantic um, that I care that much about her civic engagement. So it's that type of thing that I do. I'll sign up my family for, for voting and emailing and all this stuff. And they're just like, I know it's coming from you. And I'm like, exactly, because I love you and you should find this romantic and, 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 and amazing. So it's really funny, but I think it's just important that, that at the end of the day, people did die for this right to vote and we should take it seriously. I love it, I love Can it. Can I add something real quick about, yeah. you know, and this is not conspiracy brother, even though I might look just like him, but there's a, there's a, there's a point behind this, right? 
there's a system in place that doesn't want you to fill out the sentences. There's a system in place that doesn't want you to vote. Because when we don't vote, the kinds of candidates that we typically send to tend to um, endorse or the resources that we want to come to our community, what happens when you don't vote or you don't get counted goes back to the pot. More of those resources go to other communities. Um, I mean, people will say to me, well, does it really matter who, who's in president? I mean, it's really not a difference between uh, the two parties. I'm like, you're telling me there's no difference between uh, our former candidate uh, for president, Hillary Clinton, and Donald Trump. You can't, you're, you're telling me there's no difference? And what I really hear from them is not that they don't see the difference, because they do, but in their day-to-day -day lives, how does that change things? Because they, for them, what they're worried about is having a job, right? Mm -hmm. Having a place that's affordable to live. And what I try to make the case for is part of this agenda they have is to make you feel like it doesn't matter. Part of their agenda is to, to overwhelm you with all the details if you're like, forget about it. That's, excuse me, that's intentional. And by taking some time, connecting with people, using the internet, leaning on folks and not feeling like this is something you have to do by yourself, Oh, and then one of the things like, which made me think of, um, some people actually will, like you did, like you just described, they'll, they'll go around to their families and say, all right, let's do their census. And we, we might do it together. All that is a strategy is to combat the system that wants to discourage you from being involved, right? Mm -hmm. What makes you overwhelmed with your day-to-day -day life is you'll have time to do things that are important as well. And so I say that because it, it, that's, I don't think it's a very hidden um, conspiracy. It's intentional. Uh, and that's why they do things like say that um, people, they're, they're stuffing ballots, dead people are voting. They, they say that because they want to put in confusion and division to say, oh, it doesn't really matter or your vote doesn't, I mean, doesn't count. And it's, it's all of an intentionality to get you less involved so you're not paying attention. So when they change laws, you're like, how did that happen? Well, because they did it when you weren't looking. Uh, and sometimes they do things to us when we are looking. We just, you know, weren't paying attention as much. So anyway, I just want to add that a little bit. Yeah, and, and to, to add, like, I, I've worked on campaigns as a digital strategist where my job was to create bots to, to troll voters to try to change their minds and millions and thousands of dollars used for targeted ad to try to change people's perspective. And that goes to show that there's millions of dollars in campaigns because that's how crucially important it is giving people power is so important. People want to stay in power. Um, they don't want to see change. You have people that do want to see change. It affects everything. When you go to court, how much you have to pay in court. If you're stopped by a police officer, the accountability you see from the cop, uh, you know, from the school board, the type of education your children are seeing, it affects every aspect of your life, transportation, everything. So it's crucially important to get involved, like CK said. Yeah, and I'd, I'd like to add to that too. Um, I think that, yeah, it, there, is a, there is a systemic um, attempt to reduce our trust in government or to, or to um, uh, shrink government and, to, and to, not, to make us think that the role of government doesn't actually have a real effect in our lives. It does. Um, and so um, I, I think that part of it is to um, this work is to uh, encourage one another and to and to and to restore faith in public life, um, and then and to um, and and I think that 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 kind of gets at the in terms of uh, you know it's interesting because I think that uh, what I've, what I've been thinking about recently is that while I'm um, I'm grateful to be doing this work, it's I'm also really like depressed whenever I, <laughs> whenever I just notice how um, like there's a need for to convince uh, people that government is actually really important. <laughs> um, so anyway, it's, it's that that's just where um, where I've been. No, absolutely. And, and, and you guys have been touching on like how you get educated of who to vote for, you know, because there's so many candidates there's so many things, so many bonds, so many, um, you know, different policies that that happen. Um, so do you have in addition to anything that you have already shared and then thank you for the audience members that are adding things to the chat board. So I see like vote 411, um, the League of Voter like the League of Women Voters um, website. I know um, Kazika, you were talking about Chronicle. 
um, you know, like, and like in addition to the candidates sometimes, like, you know, with all those, like when they're talking about special, like the bonds and, and policies, how, how do you guys um, stay abreast with all of this, you know, and like, whether it's social media, now that we have so much information in our hands all the time, like, you know, do you tend to, um, are there, you know, certain sites or certain political platforms that you follow, or do you try to like get both perspectives and, and, you know, teach us? Well, I got, I, I'm, real quick, um, it's, it sounds kind of silly, but you know how when you're looking for a good restaurant, you want to go on a date with your special someone, right? What, what do you typically do? You go online, and if you don't have time to go online, you ask your friends. Voting works sometimes the same exact way. I don't know where to go. I'm new to town. I'm not sure if I want Asian or Italian. <laughs> and so what do I do? I call my friends and say, hey, uh, who, who's who, judge who versus judge that? Which one should I go for? I go. And that's okay because I have a trusting relationship with people who I can lean on. And I don't have to be the, 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 the bastion of information on every critical issue. I mean, yes, there's League of Women Voters and the Chronicle and the newspaper. That's great. If you if you have the time to do that, great. But there's nothing like being the call of a trusted friend like, hey, who are you voting for? And, and, and to be honest, a lot of people do that. You know, the other thing that impacts people voting, and I, I try to go against it, is the last sign you saw on someone's yard. I kind of hate that, but there's a reason why people do that. Like, oh, yeah, I remember that. I don't know that person. But I know that person. And I'll be honest, I've kind of done that sometimes because there's so many candidates, it's hard to stay informed. And so, you know, I'm talking about two different Democrats, so I'll, I'll vote for the one that I maybe see more often. And I hate to admit that, but it, that's sometimes I'm, I'm, I don't feel so like pressured to pick one over the other. I go with the one that feels more familiar or oftentimes go with a friend who says, hey, these are my recommendations. And so having that little kitchen table of advisors can really help you to kind of shortcut and hack the process so you're not feeling like you have to stay abreast of every little thing that's going on. Great, so word of advice to anybody running, please get a yard sign and put it the very last step before you get to the polls. <laughs> <laughs> not sure. And, and also, if you are trying to find like, you know, take someone on a date, just get Angelica and she'll just like get your phone and start texting start signing you up on the newsletter of political cam um, candidates. So. Um, any, anyone else? Yeah, yeah I just, sometimes uh, found um, uh, uh, just reading local uh, papers helpful. Um, uh, they won't cover everything, but there's some, some, you know, they'll cover some of the figures. And so, um, I, I have found that helpful in the past, um, but but yeah, I, I'd echo uh, Kazike. I um, um, I've asked friends as well, um, and then actually, you know, it's interesting is that it does actually kind of um, uh, encourage and maybe even force a conversation <laughs> with one another, and then that's actually maybe good too, because like we're like, well, actually, I'm not sure. Um, is that really, you know? So I would um, echo 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 that. Yeah, another another thing that I've um, done in the past is if I don't feel like doing the research, I'll type up a bunch of questions and just send it to their contact information on their website. Most of them are super excited just to have anybody reaching out, especially when it comes to local uh, races. So I'll type up all this information. Sometimes they'll be like, can I call you? I'm like, yeah, for sure. Let's talk. And then, um, you know, I'll tell them right away. No, you don't have my vote. Um, but I appreciate you calling back. Uh, I've done that sometimes when I'm trying to waste the candidate's time to help the other candidate get out the vote. So, you know, you, you got to get creative on it. But yeah, I think contact forms are great. Signing up your partner uh, on, on text is great. I like the Kazike's idea of pinging your friends. I've definitely done that in the past. It's, it's been pretty entertaining to see people's thoughts when it comes to voting. If I add something to, uh, am I on? I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, Sometimes when candidates, I know we talked earlier about not wanting the government to come to your house. One thing that's been valuable is when candidates, actual candidates, not their surrogates, uh, but when they actually come to your home. I actually remember voting for someone in, in the county because they were both really strong candidates. They were both smart. 
They're both lawyers. There was a lot of them, from what I could tell, seemed very similar. But what made the difference is one actually visited my house twice. And I was like, I'm rooting for them. I like them. Now, I'm not sure how much of a difference it made. But for me, it made a difference because I felt like, oh, this person actually came to my neighborhood and, and, and answered all my questions and was, you know, personable. And that makes a difference, too. So uh, if, you have the, if you ever have the opportunity to actually meet the candidates, that's your opportunity to, to drill more questions and pepper them with all kinds of stuff. Or do what Jelly does, which is delay them so they can't go anywhere else. You know, he has this imagery of her that chaining her candidates down in her basement. <laughs> no, but it really is so important, you know, especially, I mean, like the board of trustees, uh, you know, like when you're, when they're running for these type of things, like school boards and everything, I, I, I didn't even realize that like people that are running, like some of them are even volunteer positions. So if you're on the board running for like ACC or AISD or Round Rock or wherever, these, these school boards, they're putting hard, you know, like their campaign money into running for serving the community, yet it being a voluntary job. So then you think about who can actually afford that and who's going to be able to throw fifty to seventy-five thousand dollars for a campaign and buy yard signs because we know it's important now, and then to actually put that, you know, there to um, you know, to then serve and, and have a job that you're not getting paid for. So that's the other things that we need to like think about too, is to like support um, whether I am a big fan of like time, talent and treasure. So if you have like the time to then help campaign for people, if you have the money, then help donate for people. And then if you have their talent, like whatever it may be, design, graphic design or bake sale or something to really help out these candidates, especially those that, um, don't have the resources. Um, and thank you for, I think there was another question. Um, so Laura with, asked, without schools, um, sorry, I just have a pop-up. Um, without schools being in, what platforms have we used locally to talk about the census? So um, I'll just speak on behalf of the, what the Asian uh, Complete Count Committee has been doing. Um, so, um, by the way, uh, with regards to schools, um, AIS AISD has their own CCC as well, and um, there's a lot of programming, like virtual programming, I think, and, and um, you know, uh, there, uh, so if, if you haven't heard of anything about the census, I, there is outreach um, planning underway, um, and um, I know, for example, coming back to the Asian CCC, um, that uh, some organizations have actually launched a um, student competition to, to try to uh, encourage students to submit creative work, maybe even like dance, like video, uh, videos of their dances or um, uh, some kind of their own like creative PSA video um, about the census and that as a, uh, and then the incentive is like, it's like a prize, kind of like what uh, you're doing, Emily, with Brave. Um, and um, and then I think part uh, like a, a large part of it is to to leverage the um, networks that we all have, and so um, the uh, you know like, I mean coming back to relational organizing, which is that you leverage the networks that you have, and then um, utilize like the the email lists and the uh, newsletters, um, and then even some chat groups as well. Um, uh, including social media um, to uh, to check in with one another with your community uh, about um, about the significance of the census. So I think there are a lot of um, community groups that are um, being vocal about it using their pla community platforms. Um, um, and uh, there is a census action team that's being run uh, uh, in partnership with Travis County and City of Austin that um, that has um, inviting some further ideas as well. But obviously, this has been um, um, the the uh, the pandemic has thrown a wrench into everything, and then so we've all had to pivot really quickly uh, into digital organizing. Anyone else want to follow up or clear? Um, Sarah asked, "Are people experiencing homelessness encouraged to complete the census?" Yes. 
think so, yes. Um, one thing, I mean, to carry on, like, whether it's a census or, like, registering to vote or to actually vote, um, now, especially with, you know, COVID and the, the safety and health um, precautions, um, what recommendations do you have to encourage, like, either the individual or to get their community to go out and, you know, take this, fill out the census to, um, to register to vote and to actually vote in the fall? Or even now, like right, I'm sorry. There's there's going to be um, runoff elections, I believe, that start. I think Jen just posted up there, but there's there's um, you know elections that typically happen at like libraries or the the schools. So if they're closed now, or you know people are concerned of their safety and health and are um, you know the health compromised. What do you do? You have, are there any recommendations you have, or possibly the audience, if you want to share any in, in the chat board too? So, and you're asking about voting, or are you asking about the census specifically? Um, I think let, let's focus more on sorry the voting because census we know right now you have we were talking about it earlier that you have the on you can fill out the forms online, you can call in, and then you can mail it. Um, so, let's that was kind of the three steps that you can do now, and then. Let's focus on, on voting, like registering to vote and to vote. Well, definitely register to vote if you haven't already. Um, uh, the, I have to remember all the details, but you know, right now we're going through court battles about people's ability to actually do a mail-in mail voting. Uh, again, we have a government that's being led by our president who's basically seeding uh, uh, souls, uh, uh, basically making people doubt the system and saying, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a corrupt system to get people to mail in vote when he's actually mail, vote, mail in voted himself several times. Um, and and the, most states have very strong systems in place to make sure people's votes are counted and all the, you know, the protections folks are looking for. I think the challenge for Texas is that um, last I heard, so correct me if I'm saying this wrong, but um, there, if it goes to the Texas Supreme Court, there's concerns that they might reverse the current kind of um, ruling that we have, which says we can use mail-in votes. So there's still some unanswered questions as far as that's concerned. But right now, it's easy. You can do mail-in votes as far as the things are now. But it's still early in the game. That might change between now and November. Uh, but it's important to know that. And so if you're not registered, I would say make sure you do get registered. Uh, it's relatively easy to register to vote. Uh, and, and I think one of the things I want to emphasize here um, word of mouth is still one of the most powerful ways of getting people to do things. So uh, uh, ask your friends and they might look at you crazy because you've never asked them before, uh, but that's okay. I mean, that's why they're friends. So you ask them, hey, you vote. I, I have many of my friends who I'll, like, um, I feel like I'm maybe Angelica and I have her brother and sister or something because um, I, I do the same thing. I'll email some of my, my cousins like you vote. I'm like, I haven't heard from you in six months. Oh, did you vote? <laughs> this is my question. <laughs> Did you vote? Is my question. Because um, it's, you know, and, and oftentimes some of my cousins stuff will, they're like, oh, yeah, I guess I should vote. Um, so, word of mouth is very powerful. So, don't um, minimize the importance of your voice with your peers to encourage them to do the right kinds of things. Yeah, and I know um, for, for me, a couple things that I've done is I'll get in on early voting. That way I don't have to be around people if I need to do it quick. Usually I do this for the primaries. Um, for the general election, I'll throw like parties. I'll challenge a couple friends of mine. We come out, we hang out at the voting line. Due to the coronavirus, you know, wear a mask. Uh, I think it's important for safety. If you're not into wearing a mask, just think about, you know, the safety of others, right? It's really important. But yeah, throwing, throwing little parties with your friends, uh, you know, uh, I throw parties afterwards where we get to watch the election. It's such a great time. We get to challenge each other, have intellectual conversations, but also remember that it's crucially important for the community. And then you can also register yourself to be a voter, um, voter registrar and you can you know, sign up your whole family, your whole community. You can take that action for yourself if you feel like your family doesn't really trust the government too much. You can get trained yourself. Uh, the training's free and then you can go out and, and register your friends and family, and then challenge them. Be the one to take initiative. If you feel like, you know, there's some folks in, that, in your circles that are not really too fond of government or are not that much civically engaged, be the one that takes the charge, create a Facebook event, invite your friends to come out, 
get registered, register them, and then make sure you wear a mask if you are going to go in person. But I recommend going in the, in the morning. Some of them open at 7 a.m. You're going to catch folks that want to be sleeping and they want to stay at home. Be that person first on the line if you, if you want to be able to vote, get in early. Because in the afternoon, that's where you're going to be in line, maybe four to five hours sometimes in specific areas. People are waiting a long time to vote. So just try to figure out a time that makes sense for you. And you could also look it up online if they let you vote outside of your district. That's, that's also another option. Great, thank you so much. Um, and thank you, I think there, we're getting more comments. Um, again, I'll be copying and pasting um, some of the information in the links and then also adding more to our next newsletter. Um, so if you are, um, if you registered through Zoom, we um, will add you to our newsletter and um, you're welcome to unsubscribe. It's just something that we try to provide as resources to the community. Um, and so if there's any, if does any of the audience have any questions, feel free to let us know. Um, I just want to, our, our signature last question for the Brave Communities Conversations are always um, make ATX brave and brave basically stands for building relationships, awareness, voices, and engagement. So um, if you don't, each of the panelists don't mind sharing like your top two, um, one or two advice of how do we make ATX brave. We'll start with Hannah. Okay. <laughs> I'm going middle now. <laughs> okay. um, yeah. So um, um, this is not meant to be a, a cheesy um, piece of advice at all. Um, I, I really do believe that we have to start from a place of love and compassion. Um, uh, I think that because we're um, we're on overdrive these days, especially, um, and then for those of us, uh, uh, you know, wherever we are, whether we're protesting outside or protesting from home, um, morning, um, I think um, we have to um, anchor our our body in that place of compassion first, and I think it's only from there that we can connect and with with one another and we recognize that there's there's real there's a sacredness in all living things and that we're all interconnected in ways that we don't always see um and so i think that from that place we can also be um um like be gentle as well um as you as we become present to this more this moment of collective mourning because i think it really is a collective practice um and then the other piece of advice I would, and this is not so much an advice, as I'm saying this, like I'm like trying to, I'm, it's like something I'm processing myself. Um, there's, we're in a time right now where this is a, this is an unveiling um, of, of something that's been there for a really long time. Um, and so we have a lot of, um, for those of us who are who are reckoning with it in a more raw way, um, it, that's a lot of hard work, internal hard work that we have to do, not only individually but like in our own communities. Um, and so, um, I would say just give yourself that space for that reckoning um, and do it together because otherwise, like you might go crazy. <laughs> so, great, thank you, um, Kuzike. Well, um, you know, I've been doing this my whole life. So uh, take, a, take a step, if you haven't already, to figure out how you're going to end racism in our community. It's, uh, it's in our water. It's in our, it's in our culture. It's everywhere. Uh, like someone said, it's not the shark, it's the water. Um, when you're dealing with racism, it's easy to focus on <clears throat> what seems like the evil entity that's right there when the actuality is all over us. And so I think any small step that you can take to end racism in this country and other forms of injustice, that's a, that's a great thing. Uh, other thing is um, um, figure out how we're gonna try to enjoy this city after this pandemic is over with. Um, we have some really great things going on. We have some really great people. And I think sometimes when we get isolated <laughs> and alone, we forget how wonderful the city uh, can be. 
Um, and if there's a way that you can find a way of connecting with that part of the city and the movement networks, I think it can be something that will allow us to actually endure through this to the end. So, thanks. Great, thank you. Shelly? Um, I, I think, you know, challenging people, if you have the opportunity and space, and because it can also be really challenge, um, taxing to a person to, to have conversations where you're trying to hear people out, like Hannah said. I remember, I recall a conversation with uh, a veteran, a disabled veteran, actually. We were arguing on Facebook, right? We were arguing on Facebook about my humanity, you know, being able to just be a member of the LGBTQ community. He thought I shouldn't exist and shouldn't have the right to marry. And I just sent him a Facebook DM and I said, look, let's, let's do a Skype and let's just talk. Next thing you know, we're on Skype for two whole hours and I'm telling him about me and he's telling me that he got shot in the head and he's just angry um, at the world and just sad. And, and then, you know, I'm showing him compassion. And next thing you know, he's like, you know what? I was wrong all along. I'm sorry. I'm just so angry um, that I just troll people on Facebook. And I'm just like, let's find out additional ways to engage. But that type of engagement, I, I've been able to have conversations with people, picking up the phone, being on Skype, people that I've never met to listen to what they're saying, because it's important to know what the opposing party is thinking to see maybe I need to challenge my views a little bit more. Um, and then the second thing uh, to be is get civically engaged by taking a step of you know, signing up to speak in city council, you know, state, state ledge, you know, writing something out, signing up to speak, you get to meet a lot of interesting people and you get to speak your mind. And it's really empowering and powerful. And for your senators, it's the best way to get a hold of them is to send them a fax. Because when you call, they just put it into the system and they actually don't never deliver the message to them. So the best way to ensure that you get a message to your senators is to send them a fax or to talk to their local community lead. Uh, and it's just a good way for you to write a letter and say, this is how I feel, this is my truth. And you never know, sometimes it can make a difference. That's amazing, thank you for that. Do not donate your fax machines yet. Um, so, <laughs> that is great. Um, but thank you so much. Does any, um, I, there, there's so much information on the chat, so I'm very excited to, um, copy and paste this and put this in on our newsletter. And then again, as always, if you're a community group and you have any um, events or activities going on, we share that on our newsletter and then also as much as we can on, on social media. Um, but thank you again. I do wanna push again, we're going to be doing the um, Brave Census Challenge and thank you to the um, Austin Asian Census Count Committee for helping to fund this. Um, so we're, we're doing, um, follow our Facebook, follow our Twitter or Instagram, and then we're going to um, randomly ask you to tag people and then fill out your census. And the more you tags you get, I'm a, uh, my a student did this, um, they're much more wise than I am. And so um, they tag people and then we'll gift card with NG Cafe, which is a delicious Thai restaurant up north and then um, Slab Barbecue, which is a delicious barbecue restaurant um, that's sat north and southwest. So, um, so for the attendees that are here, those that um, persevered all the way through 815, um, if you fill out your census and you want to just um, put your, I'm gonna pick the first person that puts their name on the chat, we'll give you a gift card. Um, and then just again share with your friends and family that's we're going to be doing this throughout the month of june so we want people to fill out their census and get their friends to be more engaged um but thank you thank you thank you thank you again hannah angelica and kazike um thank you to the audiences um whether you're on zoom or on facebook and um we will talk to you soon be safe and let's continue to um make the movement forward and and progress with change thank you so much I can't leave because I need to copy this. <laughs> Thanks for the invite, Emlyn. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks yeah, so much, thank you. Good seeing you. Good meeting you, Hannah. Take care. You too, Kazike and Angelica. Bye, y'all.
Bye.